Hi there. Today we're going to examine why improving your biologics workflow is important. Biological therapeutics are an ever-growing market, and some of the most well-known drug treatments today are the result of years of biologics development. However, these molecules are expensive and time-consuming to produce, and as you know, there is no guarantee your initial candidate or formulation will be successful in the clinic. However, researchers like you can and do increase the chances of success by better understanding the stability parameters of their candidates. To that end, there is a growing need for efficient quality data addressing this concern. We developed the Prometheus Panta with you in mind, and today we will spend about half an hour showcasing how the instrument works and how it can give you a deeper understanding of your candidate's long-term stability parameters. I'm Charles Heffern, the product manager for the Prometheus instrument line. Over the last few years, I've had the pleasure of working with our talented development team to integrate dynamic light scattering optics into the Prometheus, and I'm so excited to showcase how this addition has been helping researchers like you drive their characterization to new heights. My colleagues, Dr. Leah Pandisha and Leah Valla, are the nanotyper specialists who will be sharing the technical aspects of the Prometheus Panto. A few notes before we get started about how to use this platform. You'll see a panel at the bottom of your screen with a few icons. The media player is the icon in red. That's where you'll be viewing the session. The slides section will display how to use this platform. If at any time during the talk, you think of a question, select the purple Q&A box and enter the question. You'll see it disappear once you hit enter and submit. However, don't be worried. That's what happens as the question is submitted to us and we'll be able to see it on our end. A specialist will be in touch with you after the session is concluded to address your questions. Every panel can be minimized or resized by you at any time during the event. Before we begin to discuss how groups are already leveraging Prometheus Panta to optimize their biologic candidate selection, formulation, and development, I would like to bring in Leah, who will explain to us what technologies are integrated into the instrument and how the combination works together to give you the deepest understanding yet of your biologics. Thanks, Charles. So before we get into um, the white paper discussion later on, I currently want to give a baseline for the technologies involved in the Prometheus Panta. So with Panta, we have three different technologies that are integrated into the instrument. Uh, Nano DSF is going to monitor the thermodynamic characteristics of protein unfolding. Large aggregation formation can be better understood through turbidity measurements. And now particle sizing can be assessed with the addition of the DLS optics. And all of these are easily obtained and analyzed using our control and stability analysis software. So protein behavior can be complicated and by monitoring the conformational stability as well as the colloidal stability is really imperative to fully characterizing your biological molecule. And by coupling nano DSF, back reflection, and DLS measurements, we can better understand the complex behavior of these molecules and the different states they take as a function of temperature. Our Prometheus line uses nano DSF or differential scanning fluorometry to detect subtle changes in the fluorescence of tryptophan and tyrosine residues present in virtually all proteins. And the fluorescence of tryptophan and tyrosine is strongly dependent on the solvent environment. And by following changes in the fluorescence uh, 330 and 350 representative of the folded and unfolded states of um, the molecule, the thermal stability can be assessed label free. So this dual UV technology allows for rapid fluorescence detection, which provides unmatched measurement speed and quality. Um, it yields ultra high resolution unfolding curves, which enable the detection of even small unfolding signals. Since there is no secondary reporter floor for, unlike conventional DSF, um, protein solutions can be analyzed independent of buffer compositions, as well as over a very wide concentration range from roughly 200 mg per mil down to five micrograms per milliliter. And this allows for the analysis of detergent solubilized membrane proteins, as well as highly concentrated antibody or enzyme formulations. 
So to determine the presence of large protein aggregates in solution, we're using our back reflection technology to probe sample turbidity. And back reflection is measuring the amount of light attenuated by the sample. So in the figure on the left here, we have the cross section of two capillaries that sit on a mirrored surface on the sample stage. And in a sample where no aggregation is occurring, the incident light is directed into that sample capillary and roughly 100% of that light is reflected back to the detector. In a sample where aggregation does occur, the incident light is going to be scattered off those large particles in solution so that not all of that light is returned to the detector and it's effectively attenuated. And the amount of attenuated light is then plotted as a function of temperature shown here on the right, and therefore serves as a measure of the total aggregation in a sample. To probe uh, oligomerization and small particles in solution, we use DLS optics in the panta. So here, laser light is directed into the sample capillary and back scattered by particles in solution. And this backscattered light is going to fluctuate in intensity due to the Brownian motion of these particles. And the backscattered light um, is then going to be, or these fluctuations is then going to be analyzed as a function of time. And the raw data or the autocorrelation function describes the rate of these intensity fluctuations and determines the probability that a particle is found in the same location over a period of time. As larger particles are undergoing slower Brownian motion, they are going to have a slower decay, while faster, smaller moving particles have an autocorrelation function that decays more rapidly. And by fitting this autocorrelation function, we can determine the diffusion coefficient. And from the Stokes-Einstein relationship, we can then calculate the hydrodynamic radius or the particle size. So while the autocorrelation function tells you information about the radius of your sample, it also gives you the polydispersity index or the PDI. And this is a measure of the heterogeneity of the particle sizes and can be used as a metric for sample quality. So in the top figure, we have a monodispersed sample. And in the intensity distribution plot, we see a single very narrow sharp peak, indicating that there is one particle species present, which has a very monodispersed distribution. In the bottom figure, we have a polydispersed sample in this capillary, and the intensity distribution plot shows two peaks indicating that there are two different particle species with different radii, and these peaks are relatively broad, which indicates that they are more polydispersed than, say, this monodispersed example on top. It sounds like there's a lot going on here, Via, and that there is a lot of data that is coming out from these measurements. And so, with the need of biologic characterization in mind to be able to report high quality results, uh, to be able to make clear and informed decisions about which formulation is the optimal formu formulation or candidate molecule possesses the stability properties that are most probable to lead to a successful um, commercialization of that candidate molecule in the clinic, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about how these different measurement modalities are incorporated into an instrument to be able to provide the highest quality of results achievable and obtainable so that researchers and groups who are using Prometheus Panta can really have confidence in the decisions that they are making based upon the results that they are, are measuring and getting. Yeah, certainly. So in the Prometheus Panta, to acquire the fluorescent sample signal, um, capillaries are used as a sample container, and each capillary is going to hold 10 microliters of sample. These capillaries are sitting directly on this thermal element here, which is used to steadily heat the samples up to the desired end temperature based on a specified thermal gradient. And this direct contact is going to result in more precise temperature control, which means that we're going to have higher reproducibility not only between capillaries, but also between runs. And as the capillaries are heated, this entire tray is going to be moved below the optics in the instrument to constantly scan and acquire data points, which allows for simultaneous measurement of nano DSF, back reflection, and DLS data in a single thermal ramp. So there are two optical heads in the Panta. Um, this one is going to hold the fluorescence back reflection LEDs and detector, which acquires the emission signal at 330 and 350. And then the second optical head holds the DLS laser and its detector. And when designing the Panta, the user feedback played a really big role. And we didn't want to sacrifice data quality obtained with nano DSF and back reflection optics by adding DLS optics. 
So we use a blue laser wavelength and a PMT detector to allow the pan to, to rapidly acquire DLS measurements without compromising the thermal unfolding data quality. And in addition, this blue wavelength and the detector angle we use also help to optimize the amount of scattered light intensity for smaller particle sizes while still being sensitive to trace amounts of aggregates in samples. But instead of me describing the, how the instrument works, um, let's take a trip to our headquarters in Munich, where my colleague, Dr. Leia Valla, is going to give you an in-person tour of the instrument. Hello everyone and welcome to our eDemo space here at the Munich headquarters. My name is Lea Valla and I will be your tour guide for this short overview of the Prometheus Panta instrument and its software interface. So let's imagine that you have prepared your samples and you are ready to start a measurement. The Prometheus Panta has been meticulously designed to be easy and intuitive for you to work with. So to begin, you just have to press the open button on the touch display and as you can see the door is automatically opening to give you access to the capillary tray. The Panta allows for single capillary measurement as well as the measurement of capillary chips for higher throughput experiments. In the single capillary measurement mode you can measure 48 samples all at once while with the capillary chip you have 24 capillaries mounted on the chip and they match the position of 384 well plates for faster loading. Let's have a closer look. The first element you will notice here is this metallic lead. This lead is magnetic and it allows the Panta to measure DLS, nano DSF, back reflection with the proper focus. The lead is also allowing the heating element here to have contact with the entire capillary surface throughout the measurement for proper heat transfer and therefore the most accurate measurement possible. The second element you will see is the capillary adapter. This is the adapter for the single capillary measurement and you can see that it's numbered from 1 to 48 for you to place your capillaries on it. So now if you would like to switch for flexible throughput between the single capillary mode and the capillary chip, it's really easy. I could remove the adapter and now I can take a capillary chip that you can see here. And I can simply place it on the tray, fix it as well with the lid. and we are good to go. Of course, before going, let's see how to load the capillaries. So I will take the example of the capillary chip and you can use a capillary loading station on which you can adjust your 384 well plate and by simply approaching the chip to the loading station, you see that it matches the 384 well plate and it allows 24 capillaries to be loaded in a matter of seconds. I will bring you closer. So here you can see the 384 well plate. And now if I simply approach the capillary chip, you see that it matches the position and it's really easy to load. So each capillaries, both in the single capillary mode and in the capillary chip, have a capacity of 10 microliters. And in terms of concentration, we recommend to start at 1 milligram per milliliter, but you are flexible to go higher or lower depending on your experimental needs. Let's place the capillary chip back. Let's not forget the lid. And now we are good to go. So we can just simply close the door and the rest of the experiment and the experiment setup can be done directly from the software interface. So come with me and we will have together a closer look at the software directly from the computer. Let's go. So we are now at the computer and as you can see, Panta has two software, the Panta control 
in blue and the Pantara analysis in white. The Panda control software is meant to design and run your experiments, while the Panta Analysis software is for looking in-depth at the results of those experiments. Today we are not going to talk about full experimental setup, but I want to take a moment and show you some results, so you can see how the software is intuitive for its users. Let's start with the Panta control. This software is for starting new experiments, but here we are looking at a completed run. The data will populate in real time, so it means that during the course of your experiment you can always come in and check how things are going. You see that you have several tabs here that will guide you through the settings, including the optics settings, but also the settings for your thermal ramp for the thermal denaturation experiment. Here the size analysis tab will give you also an easy visual readout of the results in the form of a violin plot displaying size distribution. It is also really easy here in the data table to annotate your samples after the experiment was run or to add new annotation and more details about your samples. So, all in all, I hope that the Panta Control software um, can allow you to quickly and easily adjust your experiment settings, annotate and modify your results, both during and after the run is completed. When this run is complete, you can open the file in the analysis software and do the more in-depth data analysis. So, this is what we are going to do. So, here you see the same file, but uh, in the Panta analysis and we are also looking here as the size analysis view. The software will automatically determine if you have a good correlation and good autocorrelation fits and will remove obvious outliers. However, you can also review for yourself the individual acquisition and do a manual quality control, remove any acquisition you uh, the software did not automatically remove by itself. Now we also made the software quite flexible because we know every researcher will have different needs when it comes to what parameters are the most important for them. So the software allows you to toggle the parameters for your evaluation. You have here different way to um, display the analysis. You can also choose different columns to display in the table. And finally, you can choose key parameter you want to have an in-depth look at. Lastly, what I want to show you is that the Panta analysis can allow you to export the data you need for sharing or presenting, both as raw data and I, an image of the fit curve, sorry. So you see that you are flexible in the format you want to export the tables, also, you can export images, as I mentioned, PDF files and Excel tables. And you can decide to export everything or just a few selected rows. So, I hope this brief tour of Panta helped you to better understand how the instrument and the software work. I want to thank you for stopping by and now hand over back to Charles and Leah, who will be discussing how one group found the multi-parameter evaluation of Panta useful for their own biologics formulation workflow. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leia, for that really nice overview of how groups can begin to use the Prometheus Panta in a very practical way to extract all of that valuable information that Leah has been telling us about the technologies are able to provide. At this point in the conversation, I think it would be really nice if we go ahead and begin to talk about how some groups are already beginning to use Prometheus Panta to better develop their biologics. In this case, I would like to ground and center our conversation on a publication that was put out by a group at a, at a CRO called TwoBind, where they show how they were using the Prometheus Panta to better formulate and develop an HIV vaccine candidate protein that is called BG505 SOSIP, that is one of the spike proteins on the HIV capsid. 
When thinking about where Prometheus Panta can fit and provide value in the biologic development and characterization workflow and processes, it really can provide value across a very broad range of different activities. From the earliest stages of biologic development, when we're talking about target identification and validation, all the way through to the very final stages and very late stages when we're talking about the clinical development and manufacturing concerns as we are bringing the molecules to the patients whose lives they will be helping. When, when focusing our conversation here, we're going to focus on a couple of key parts throughout that process that are featured by the group at TwoBind. To begin with, we're going to focus on the applications of the instrument and the technology to a higher throughput stability screen when looking at the thermal stability of this vaccine candidate and a couple of different formulations, a panel of different formulations using the nano DSF and back reflection optics. And so Leah, can you give us uh, walk us through and talk us through what the results were, were shown here? I sure can. So first we're looking at the nano DSF data and looking at thermal stability and thermal unfolding of the BG505 SOSIP in 96 different formulation buffers. So we have a lot of data here. And what they are assessing is the thermal stability by looking at the melting temperature or the TM value. And from this data, we can see that that TM ranges from roughly 52 degrees to 72 degrees, where the larger the melting temperature, the more thermodynamic thermodynamically stable the sample is going to be. Yeah, so looking at this figure, there is a lot of data there already when we look at the thermal stability of this molecule in these different formulations. So with that in mind, are there any concerns that you have seen that groups have when thinking about integrating these higher throughput screens into their workflows? Yes, um, that's a great question. I think the two main things uh, that groups are interested in is, is it reproducible and um, what's the precision of the instrument? So uh, I am kind of highlighted some of these points earlier um, in my technical talk today where we have precise temperature control. So the capillaries are sitting on this thermal element, um, which allows us to get very reproducible data between capillaries and also between different runs. So we kind of highlight the reproducibility of the Prometheus Panta. The other concern is making sure that we're getting um, TM values that are actually, you know, the precision of the instrument is very good and that we're able to detect those subtle changes in the unfolding signals. And we can do this um, not only because uh, Panta is very quick, it obtains a lot of uh, data and a lot of data density, particularly in that unfolding transition, and also by monitoring the uh, ratio of the uh, fluorescent signal at 350 and 330, we can get these high resolution curves to give users more clear and concise answers and be more confident with their data. And we actually have um, some collaborators at Amgen which nicely highlighted this reproducibility um, in an article published later last year. So once uh, the researchers at Tubine did this initial thermal screen, they then um, kind of picked a couple buffers which had the greatest thermal stability and they then wanted to um, find that optimal formulation buffer for the target sample and they did this by taking a deep dive into the colloidal stability of the sample with DLS by looking at both the uh, particle size as well as the PDI to choose that optimal buffer and Charles is going to um, introduce us to that data now. Yeah, thanks Leah. Um, so to start with, as you said, the group is showing here a couple of different of these buffers or formulations that they were testing with their thermal stability screen as shown in the data that you presented. However, instead of having all 96 samples laid up on one figure, which can be a little overwhelming in terms of information that is contained there, they're only showing three selected of those buffers and formulations here. Um, which is the data that we're looking at on the left, where we are looking at that thermal stability of buffers 9, 57, and 70 that span from 60 degrees up to 72 degrees. When trying to identify that optimal formulation or, or buffer for a biologic candidate, though, 
one of the really complex one of the things that adds a lot of complexity here is the complexity of the structure of these molecules themselves, which means that there are a number of different stability coordinates that one needs to keep in mind when thinking about what does it mean for this molecule to be stable. This goes beyond just the thermal stability, the temperature at which a protein unfolds, and also includes properties like the colloidal stability or the propensity to form aggregates in solution, even at room temperature or through various stressing conditions, which needs to be tested to understand what is you know, the stability profile of your molecule as a whole. And here again, the, the properties of the Prometheus really tie into helping groups to make better and more informed decisions about identifying the optimal formulation by providing that level of clarity and precision on the results so that groups can understand and differentiate the behavior of their molecules in these different conditions. Looking at the figure on the right, what we are looking at here is a size distribution analysis of the different size species that were identified in these solutions using the dynamic light scattering optics of the Prometheus Panta in these three different formulations. So on the x-axis, we have the different size of particles, different size ranges, and on the y-axis, we have the relative frequency of the scattering intensity from particles of those sizes. If we think about buffer 70 to begin with, which was the least thermally stable of these three uh, formulations that they are showing in this diagram, we can see that along with that lower thermal stability, this buffer also failed to provide the level of colloidal stability that would be necessary for the protein for this vaccine candidate to be successful in the clinic. Here we can see that there is the formation of particulate at approximately 100 nanometers and hydrodynamic radius that would uh, potentially introduce liabilities when we're thinking about bringing this molecule to patients. Conversely, if we look at the two more thermally stable conditions, buffer 9 and buffer 57, we can see that while buffer 9 had superior thermal stability, it actually also suffered from the liability of, of not providing the level of colloidal stability that would be necessary for successful clinical development of this molecule, as even in this formulation that provided the superior thermal stability, we still had the formation of aggregates at approximately 100 nanometers in hydrodynamic radius. By screening buffer 57, however, we can see that in this condition, although the stability wasn't quite as high on our thermal um, property axis or coordinate as it was in buffer 9, this formulation actually prevented the formation of any sort of uh, larger aggregates in solution, as can be seen via a, a more, let's say, tight hydrodynamic radius and a lower polydispersity index. So looking at this data, there's not uh, necessarily a clear trend between the thermal stability and the colloidal stability. Would you expect the thermal stability and the hydrodynamic radius or PDI to correlate? Yeah, actually, that is something that groups have been probing for a very long time, and there is a very robust body of literature on this. As groups are looking for, let's say, these parallels or, or these causalities or relations between these different properties. And really what the body of literature has been saying over all of these years is that while sometimes these properties can be related to one another, that really at the end of the day, these are independent properties of the molecules that really need to be understood on their own, which is why groups who are working on the development of biologics perform this this litany of different stability indicating measurements uh, on them, right? Why they perform their, their size exclusion chromatography, their AC sins, and all of these different measurements, because all of these different types of approaches probe different properties about these molecules that are not necessarily causally related to one another, and that really need to be optimized all as a whole for a molecule to have the greatest chances of success in the clinic. Right? And that also then ties really nicely into what you were talking about previously, about the, how critical it is for each of these results and each of these measurements to provide high quality data that can be counted and relied upon, so that when the groups are looking at all of these different properties, at this complex matrix of, of information about their molecules, that they are really able to make an informed decision and have confidence in the decisions that they are making. And this then ties into precisely what the next step of this characterization workflow was that was featured 
by, by Tubine in this publication. And this was to probe the long-term stability of the of uh, this vaccine candidate molecule in this formulation, buffer 57, that was identified via these screens to see what are the effects of various stresses that can be probed these accelerated stress tests. Things like, um, let's say, elevated temperatures or mechanical stresses like freeze thaws or shaking or chemical stresses like an oxidative stress. And really, how does that impact the, uh, the, uh, the stability of the molecule? And so could you break down some of this data for us, Leah? Sure. So the first long-term stability assay that uh, the researchers looked at was the thermal stress. So they incubated uh, BG505 SOCEP in, it's in buffer uh, 57 formulation, but they incubated it at 25, 40, and 60 degrees. And we can see that at 25 and 40 degrees, um, and this is done over the course of two weeks, but at 25 and 40 degrees, there really is little to no change in both the hydrodynamic radius on the left side of the y-axis as well as the PDI or polydispersity index on the right side of the y-axis. However, when that sample was placed at 60 degrees and incubated, right off the bat, day one, you see an increase in the hydrodynamic radius from roughly six and a half to nine, as well as the PDI from about 0.15 to about 0.25, where the sample goes from a mono disperse to now a more poly disperse. And as that time increases, you see an increase in the radius as well as the PDI. And after two weeks, both the uh, size of the particle as well as uh, the dispersity of the particle has almost doubled. So looking at these results, some of these changes seem like they're relatively subtle if we think about the sample on that 60 degrees Celsius uh, um, incubation, right? So we're talking about an increase in the cumulant radius from around six and a half nanometers up to around nine nanometers over that 24 hour window, or an increase in the polydispersity index from around, let's call it like 0.1 to around uh, 0.25, right? So this then really begs the question of how sensitive is DLS to detecting aggregates? How much aggregation needs to be in the sample before you can begin to detect it here? Yeah, and I love this question because it's one of my favorite parts about DLS is how sensitive it is to um, aggregates in solution. So the scattering intensity in DLS is proportional to the particle size to the sixth power. So that means that um, larger particles are going to scatter more light. So in the case where you have a very small population of aggregates, which are large particles, um, you're still able to detect and identify those particles in solution, even if it's in a, um, a solution that has a lot of smaller spice particles because that larger particle is gonna scatter so much light. So um, small populations of large particles are gonna very easily be detected because of their size. And this um, kind of was uh, corroborated by a collaboration we have going on with another group where their nano DSF and their DLS data um, they found that the higher molecular weight species in their sample actually compromised the conformational colloidal stability of that target and that even the small population of the higher molecular weight species was able to be detected with the DLS optics and also um, this was confirmed with SEC results too. The researchers at Tubind also went on to look at the long-term stability um, with some other stressors. So they did some mechanical stress, vortexing and shaking, and then some freeze-thaw cycles, and saw really no change in both the hydrodynamic and radius, uh, hydrodynamic radius and PDI for these particular stressors. And this just kind of highlights um, how nicely the PANTA fits into the biologics workflow where you're starting with formulation development and you're going down through all the way through production and manufacturing to make sure that that target that you're using is stable throughout the entire process. And this kind of brings us to one of the last points is we know that this target molecule is stable not only in the buffer that has been chosen but also uh, over long term. But is this stability translating to its functionality? So how do we validate this molecule's functionality? And this white paper shows this being done with DLS. So the target molecule, its interaction with a partner can trigger a change in the hydrodynamic radius, and we can follow that change in the hydrodynamic radius to monitor that interaction, which Charles will now go into a little bit more. Yeah, thank you, Leah. 
So when we think about formulating these molecules and getting them ready for, for clinical success, right? Of course, all groups, and we all want to optimize the, the stability profile of these molecules to ensure that it has that, that great chance of, of success in clinic. But of course, alongside that stability profile, we need to also keep in mind that no matter how stable your molecule is, it needs to still, of course, maintain that functionality or else it's not going to do anyone any good. All right? And so with the development of this formulation, of course, the group wants to look at, does it still maintain the ability to, to drive an immune response? And can it be recognized by the neutralizing antibodies that should be interacting with the components of the virus, namely the, like, um, in this case, it's an antibody called PGT145. So when, when probing the functionality of this molecule, really what the group uh, uh, to bind was doing was looking for whether when they mixed their, their spike protein, this candidate molecule, the BG505 SOSIP, along with those neutralizing antibodies, can they identify that increase in hydrodynamic radius from the formation of a complex? And is this increase in the hydrodynamic radius specific to interaction with a neutralizing antibody and not present when the molecule is mixed with a non-interacting antibody? This negative control is shown in the right figure where we're looking at the mixture of that spike protein with the NIST monoclonal antibody, an antibody that should have no interaction with this, um, with this vaccine candidate molecule, and for which we can see there is no growth in the hydrodynamic radius as you um, mix together the two molecules. So when looking at the interaction with the PGT145, that neutralizing antibody, to validate that functionality, what the group found is that at an equal molar mixture, so right in the middle of that plot, we're at about 50-50 mixture between the PGT145 and the BG505. So you have a maximal increase in the, the measured hydrodynamic radius of your complex, which validated that indeed this neutralizing antibody was still able to recognize the, the vaccine candidate in this formulation, and that we can see this growth from around seven nanometers all the way up to around nine and a half. Conversely with that NISTMAB, you don't have any of that growth at all. And instead you just see a linear trend between the, the BG505 SOSIP on its own, all the way down to the NIST monoclonal antibody. So looking at this data, those are very subtle changes in the hydrodynamic radius. And I feel like sometimes DLS gets a bad rap where uh, it's, a, it's called a low resolution technique. Could you kind of explain what that means in the context of this paper? Yeah, for sure. Um, so here we have to be very careful about um, disambiguating what we are mean when we're talking about uh, a resolution versus a sensitivity of the technique. So clearly from these results, we can see that the DLS measurement itself is very sensitive, right? That we can identify these changes from around seven nanometers of hydrodynamic radius all the way up to nine and then back down to around six again with the protein by itself, right? That is a very separate conversation from the question about the resolution of the technique. And what we mean when we say resolution is the ability to um, separately identify different sized particles in solution. We can think about this analogously to any sort of, let's say, chromatographic type experiment, where we are trying to essentially, let's say, resolve two different peaks of different, different, ty different types of species that are in solution, right? And here in a DLS measurement, to have that type of, of resolution to be able to clearly separate the different peaks. And here, let's talk about a baseline separation of peaks that are associated with different size molecules. Those molecules need to have a size difference of approximately three to five X difference in size. If we look at our mixture of that BG505 SOSIP with the PGT145, that size change that we're seeing is only from seven to nine nanometers. And if we were to talk about that baseline separated difference in peaks for a complex formation, we would need to have a change from seven all the way up to around 21 to 35 nanometers to have that three to five X change in size, right? So with the results that we are seeing here with that validate the functionality of that BG505 SOSIP in the, the formulation 57, buffer 57, what we are looking at here is that we can confirm that yes, it does still interrupt with a neutralizing antibody, we cannot use this technique to say what percentage of the molecules and solution have formed the complex and which molecules are not interacting and are still in the monomeric state. That means that we cannot use this technique 
to make a true measurement of something like a binding affinity or a, a real interaction quantitative assessment, this is more of that qualitative assessment that we do still have that functionality. For groups that are interested in the quantitative assessment of a real binding affinity to have that type of resolution along that axis or that coordinate of, of a molecular property, there are other techniques that are better suited for that. Um, one in particular that, that I would like to mention here would be a microscale thermophoresis, whereby you could actually quantitatively measure what is the real binding affinity of those two types of molecules and what is the relative percentage of bound versus unbound species in solution. Awesome, thank you for clarifying that. Yeah, no, my pleasure. Here, this brings us to one of the main takeaways that Tubine was presenting in their publication, was that not only did Prometheus Panta provide these really high quality results that helped them to understand the behavior of this vaccine candidate in all of these different formulations and really make an informed and wise decision about the optimal formulation to, to ensure the clinical success of this molecule, that this work could also be done very efficiently, both from the perspective of the amount of material that was required, how much sample, the number, amount of micrograms required, as well as the amount of time necessary for this work. That all of this work could be conducted in a span of approximately two weeks using just micrograms of protein. Right? So by integrating Prometheus Panta into their workflow, not only could they make better decisions, they could do it faster and more efficiently. And with that, um, really, we want to just go ahead and review briefly what these findings were from this entire session, right, where we're talking about how to make a formulation workflow, how you can make your formulation workflow more efficient, right? And really, this is taking into consideration the complexities of the molecules as a whole, right, that we need to have these multi-parameter assessments of their molecules to really make the most informed decisions that we can, and that alongside of that multi-parameter assessment, we also need to understand these accelerated stability or long-term stability type measurements that let us understand how a molecule will behave after months or years of storage. And alongside of all of this, we of course need to keep the functionality of the molecules in mind that we are, are maximizing the properties of these vaccine candidates or any sort of biologic molecule along these different property coordinates, both the stability and that functionality. Thank you to everyone for stopping by. I hope you all have a better understanding of how multi-parameter evaluation in parallel along an entire thermal ramp can be extremely valuable in all aspects of biologic development workflows. We'll be wrapping up here, but if you have any questions, please don't forget to submit them via that purple Q&A box as part of the controls. And we will reach out to you personally after the event is concluded to address whatever questions you may have. Thank you again for stopping by. And please, we want to wish you a great rest of your day. Thank you.